Finally, another race weekend. I mean, listen, I've been, I've been buzzing. I've been looking forward to it all week. And free practice one starts at 930 Eastern Standard Time, uh, which is perfect for me. Um, Tim, are you staying up till one <laughs> o'clock to watch free pra- practice two in Australia? Yeah, yeah, I stay up, staying up for the whole thing, man. It's, I love it. You know, probably get to bed around uh, 4 a.m. or whatever, and then uh, get up at probably about nine because I I struggle to sleep through this, dude. Like it's hard. Like I, I know, it's like I shouldn't be complaining at all, but like my sleep schedule when they go to Australia, Japan, China, it is really hard to like for me to get consistent sleep. But yeah, that's what that's what coffee's for, man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know what, man? Like there's just something awesome about seeing like that. And maybe this just makes me such a fan, but, but, you know, seeing the Formula One account on Instagram line up with all the drivers walking into the grid for their media day on, on the Wednesday, there's just something about that every single week that there's a race yeah. that it just gets your, it's like, let's go, let's get excited. <laughs> um, so, and there's a lot to talk about. And I think the first thing, uh, obviously, I want to talk Susie Wolf, uh, because that's a pretty major thing, but I want to yep. talk quickly first about something else that's also extremely surprising. And, uh, a little bit inspiring is Carlos Sainz. You know, this is a guy that just had surgery, appendicitis, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, walks out of hospital and back to the track while Oliver Bierman finishes seventh in the Jeddah Grand Prix, which is pretty amazing. Um, or sorry, the Saudi Arabia Grand Prix in Jeddah. Um, and, and frankly, um, blows a lot of people away. And we were expecting him to be racing a Formula One car this weekend. And now Carlos Sainz, through uh, just grit and determination, is going to be racing for Ferrari. And and Tim, I wanted to ask you this: him coming in, is this sort of a sign of how important this season is to him? Oh yeah, hundred percent. You know, I think it's you know, and you and I have touched about it a lot on this show already. Is the fact that you know you can't take a race off, and if you do take a race off, that just really devalues how much you're actually you know, worth in terms as a driver. And so for Carlos, it's extremely important. He doesn't have a contract with any other team at the moment. Obviously, Lewis Hamilton is coming over, taking a spot next season. And so for Carlos, he has to make himself look very attractive uh, to other teams. So, you know, he had a really strong race in Bahrain. Maybe not the best qualifying, but his race performance was really solid. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just trying to get back that momentum adam and like not losing that feeling as a as a driver because the thing with racing drivers is is that like sometimes once you sort of hit this sort of downward spiral it just it just things get compounded and things get worse and so and it could be everything from from confidence to physicality right a hundred percent and it's like it's so important uh for him to to be back in the car as soon as possible but you know, li- listening to what he had to go through was, uh, I mean, incredible. He talked a lot about it, uh, all of it today during media day and like what what had to go down. So he was, he started to feel pretty ill. Like he, he thought he had food poisoning at one point uh, during the Saudi Arabia Grand Prix lead up. And he'd taken a bit of medication uh, to kind of help with coping for fp1 and fp2 and he kind of said like look if i'm not feeling any better by the next day so to speak then i'm gonna have to go to the hospital and essentially he ended up going to the hospital uh diagnosed him with appendicitis and then he had the surgery done and uh the way they the way they basically put it to him was like look it's going to be 14 days before you're back in the the car for the next round it's going to be really close and so you've got to really prioritize recovery. Now, the issue with Carlos having to prioritize recovery, Adam, is that, you know, you lose so much fitness. Like your body, uh, and I know this from all the training that I used to do for racing, is that, that as soon as you kind of take, let's say, like two or three days off from training, your body starts to detrain. And so you start to lose all the fitness that you've already sort of built up and ramped up and gotten yourself ready. Your body sort of starts to detrain itself. Um, And so you kind of have to ride that threshold of overtraining and undertraining and trying to get into that sweet spot, into that middle. And that's where you start your season from. And you try to maintain that throughout the year. It's really hard to do that with with, with motorsports, but um, that's where you want to set your level. The problem is, is that Carlos was in bed for all last week 
flew out yet yeah, flew out to Australia for this. He's got his work cut out for him this weekend, Adam. Like it's not like physically he may not just be there 100% and mm-hmm. that's going to be an issue for him because going through a grand prix obviously it's just it's just so much force going through your body and if you're not physically ready and built up for that i mean he did admit it he basically said look i'm going to give fp1 fp2 a go and we'll see where i'm at so yeah, and, and let's talk about your guts while you're in a race car. Not <laughs> guts as in mental guts. Let's talk about your real guts. Let's talk about your bodily organs. What happens to them when you're taking a corner uh, at full well, speed? Well, they shift. <laughs> so you're talking about a guy that's had stitches yeah. and had you know damage to his internal organs, right? I mean, that's what any surgery is. There is going to be damage to internal organs that has to heal, and he's just going to get in there and shake it up like it's a milkshake. Like, that's that's... First off, there's there's some real like mental guts to that, but there's a real risk to that too. Well, I I'm not sure uh about the like stitches and stuff. Like he he did explain uh certain tools that like doctors the doctors had to use and how far like medicine has come from the last time like his dad had it done to when he's had it done and the advancements in modern day medicine and like all of that. And he said like it's really he said it was quite simple. He's like, they take like three little tools and they sort of like place them inside of you and they sort of snip, snip and, and away it goes. And he said, it's a very, it's less invasive than even what it was two years ago. He said, so referring to like what Alex uh, Albin had to have done. Yeah. And so for, I think for, I think for Carlos, it's, that's probably has helped him sort of recover and, and get back as fast as he has. I think the most, I think I just think the the worrying thing is the fitness level, mm-hmm. and how much of that is he has he lost in like, you know, being in the race car for you know whatever ninety minutes, eighty min, you know, eighty ninety minutes is like beating and banging inside of that thing on a street course. Like it's it's gonna be that's gonna be really tough, man. And I, the, yeah, like you said, it's not a it's not like Silverstone smooth meant to be for race cars. It's this is a street yeah. course. Yeah. It's a great course. It's an awesome yep. course, but yep. it is it's a street course and yep. there are there are bumps, there are, are sharp edges. They have changed uh the Grand Prix a little bit, right? Like the actual track layout. I saw yep. I was seeing you tweet about that. Yep. Um what will that allow? Is that for more top speed? Uh yeah, so like basically more passing opportunities and this was done like a few years ago and they had uh I want to say they had the first iteration of it Last year, I, I could have gotten this all wrong, I think, but I, I can't remember. But essentially, it allows them to to pass a little bit more. It opens up the back back half of the of the racetrack and allows there to be another DRS uh, zone for them as well. So you kind of have like two DRS zones sort of stacked on each other, which allows there to be more passing into a, a later section into sector three. Um, but it, it's it was good racing last year. Like I mm-hmm. actually like. I went back, Adam, I, and I rewatched uh, the Australian Grand Prix from last year, and I just forgot how like entertaining it was. Like you had George Russell yeah. in the lead at one point, you had Lewis Hamilton in the lead, you had Max trying to get by Lewis for the lead. That old sort of rivalry starting to heat up. You had a couple crashes that red flag things, and actually was a really good Grand Isn't Prix. Isn't that the race where the Alpines crashed into each other? Too? Yeah, you had. Gasly and Ocon taking like, each other out. Like it was good, man. I, I I think like sometimes Australia can offer up some snoozers, but sometimes it can really offer up like some really great racing. Well, and it seems like the grid is ready for a really great race. Ferrari, at least, you know, forgetting Carlos Sainz' injury, I mean, both drivers came to play this year. Yeah. Uh the car seems to be far more reliable, at least through the first two races, as much mm-hmm. as you can deduce from, you know, Bahrain is almost like its own thing. Like you, you almost, you almost have to take Bahrain for what it is and, yeah. and realize that you don't know everything. Yeah. Jetta is a little bit more smooth, although it is still a street course. Mm-hmm. Um, I think by this time you're starting to t- kind of figure out who's got the, got it together yeah. and Ferrari really seems to. Yeah. And really, you know, I know everybody thinks, oh, Max Verstappen, is, he's going to win every race. And he might. He might, uh, but it only takes really one mistake, and he won't. And I know that Red Bull has finished one two every race, uh, but we know we saw last year 
um, the struggles that Perez had at certain times. Uh, we saw Max struggle on one track, and guess what? Ferrari won. It feels like, at least with Charles Leclerc, not knowing Carlos Sainz' health, that he's he's just going to be sitting and waiting, sitting and waiting for them to screw up. Yeah, I think and another thing, Adam, to add sort of on top of that is you're coming into this this weekend, a lot of folks who I've spoken to, like in lead up to, you know, a lot of people feel that, you know, Red Bull will always be the favorite coming into every race this season. But there is another team that actually could possibly provide us with a little bit more excitement in terms of putting pressure on, on Red Bull. Some people feel that Ferrari could be the faster team here this weekend. Charles Leclerc himself, like he he still speaks of them understanding where their weaknesses are, what they need to do to get that back. But knowing that they could potentially fight Red Bull for race wins this season, he still has that um, belief where a lot of the other drivers are pretty open and honest about like, hey, look, like, <laughs> like, we like, got like problems, Lewis, yeah. I think like Lewis today was like, hey, like, look, Red Bull's in a league of their own and we're not catching up to that. Yeah. But like for Ferrari, like even I think Lewis felt that Ferrari could probably uh, catch and put some a lot of pressure on Red Bull this season. And I feel that way, too, because we still don't exactly know, Adam, where Red Bull's like data point is. We don't know how much their advantage actually is because of the first two races are, you know, they're so different. So we don't really know what that advantage is. Leclerc had said three to four tenths in an interview that he did. That's that's not as 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 bad as it was last year. So. Oh, no question. No question. You know, people forget that there were no guarantees that Max was going to win his second title in a row the way Ferrari looked two years ago. Like, yeah. you think about Ferrari in Australia in 2022. Yeah, good point. Like, they were, I mean, that, that team started better. Yeah. For sure started better. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it a good was, point. It was, you know, it was the strategic screw-ups that cost Mattia Bonotto his job. But frankly, that was a really, really good car and a really yeah. good team. Um, and I, I'm looking at the... Um, I'm looking at the race and I'm, I obviously get so hyped up for this. There is a really good fight for third place already. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if the, if Red Bull is going to be one, the, the excitement around Red Bull being one is when they're not number one is yeah. when Ferrari comes in and steals a race, the fight between Mercedes and McLaren, which uses a Mercedes engine, uh, is also really exciting. There's a two point separation between them already. Uh, McLaren passed Mercedes, uh, last week. It's only two races in, um, you know, Lando, as honest as he always is, uh, was t saying that, you know, there's some things that they wish they'd progressed a little further on with the car. Obviously, we know there's some rear wing stuff that they got to work on. But that battle, if you're a real Formula One fan, that's going to be a really exciting one from two pretty epic teams. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think like I was uh, I was sitting what was it? I think it might have been yesterday. I was thinking about it. I'm like, you know, the same thing as last year. You know, if you just remove Red Bull from the equation, like that, that battle for the remaining spots is like very interesting yep. and very entertaining as well. Um, I just think with this year, we have we have like two teams that are sort of out out front a bit, and mm -hmm. then we've got a stack of like three teams yeah which would be mclaren mercedes and and, aston. and um aston martin and then we got a stack of a whole bunch of other teams just completely together mm -hmm. and then you kind of got sort of alpine just hanging on at the back end yeah. uh and obviously their issues are they're minuscule but all that adds up uh, and that's kind of like where we're at right now but by the time we get to like the european leg and you know, we get to like round seven, eight, nine, ten. Like we're gonna start to see these cars upgraded, come to life, and you know that's gonna close things up even more. Like if you look at the RB, like they have a huge upgrade. I'm told that's coming, like in races time, like a huge one that's gonna make a ton of difference. And so, like we've seen already, you know, teams do this or uh, in, in this regulation, we've seen two of them. Seen Aston Martin in 2022. We see McLaren in 2023. McLaren plus others. You saw Ferrari start to catch up to Red Bull last season. You saw Mercedes take, I don't know how they did it with the car that they had, yeah. close that gap, and then get uh, a P2 in the in the constructors. So mm -hmm. like, th it, it will happen with 
upgrades that start to come, teams just need to figure out where they're at. Right, right. And and that's, I mean, that's going to be the fun part about this course is I feel like this is where, and I know it used to be the start of the season, so it's it's there's a little bit of that going on, but this is where yeah. I feel like you can really start to track the data. Yeah. We start to really see how the first, if you divide the seasons into, into thirds, um, how the first third of the season is going to look before all the upgrades come in, race seven, race eight, that sort of thing. Yeah, and, exactly. um, and, and on the racing bulls thing, that since you brought it up, I wasn't going to bring it up till later. You know, <laughs> the, the, uh, obviously we talked about in the last episode, how, you know, Daniel Ricardo is, is really like, he hasn't had great results in Australia. He had one with McLaren and, and, you know, one DNF with, with Renault. He's had some, like a couple of good ones, never got a podium. Um, there's got to be a lot of pressure. There's going to be a lot of media, uh, probably helps the piastri's on the grid to kind of even some of that out. Um, but he's Daniel Ricardo. Uh, this racing bulls team, they can't be thrilled with the start. I wouldn't think, I think yeah. that they would probably see themselves at the top. Do you think that they're going to be able to compete with Haas and Williams before that upgrade comes? It'll be close. I'll say that like, it's going to be tight like that. That sort of battle there between that Williams Haas, I can't believe I'm saying that. I know. And, 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 I know. And, and RB, you know, that that's an, an interesting one. And then you've kind of got that the Sauber just underneath trying to close that gap as well. And then you've got Alpine below them. It is extremely tight through through those teams. Extremely close. I think that RB may have been expecting to be a little bit more competitive than mm -hmm. what they started off with. And I think a lot of that has to do with understanding what they have in terms of the new car. And then also on top of that, you know, getting all of their, cause they have a lot of new people who have joined the team, getting yep. them integrated and comfortable in their positions to understand this is my job. This is your job. This is this, this is this, this is that. And all that stuff kind of bleeds through to the car. It just does this way it works. And so, I think as they start to understand what they've got, they start to unlock more potential. We heard Daniel Ricardo sort of talk about that at the end of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, where he was kind of like, hey, I, we went in a wrong direction this way, kind of affected me this way. So we kind of understand what we need to do for the next race. Yuki did something that was a little different mm -hmm. and et cetera, et cetera. And you get more experimentation with drivers and cars. And so, yeah, Adam, I think like, I think eventually like RB expects to be a lot more competitive than what they are. But, but then again, you've got those other two teams that are, are that could possibly like with upgrades, keep pace. Right. So this is going to be, I mean, this is the, the, the fun thing about formula one is you're looking at the battles throughout the grid. It's, it's like, yeah. who's going to finish where at, you know, every place does matter. Um, I'm not going to mention Alpine right now. Cause you know, I just feel bad about it. It feels like you're punching down. Um, you know, they're, they're just, they're a mess and yeah. there, there are rumors again of like, well, maybe that's the way Andretti Cadillac gets into the sport. Yeah. Um, I have a hard time with that one, by the way, Tim, because from the business perspective, it still makes sense for Renault who own Alpine, the brand, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, uh, maintain, uh, not only being an engine supplier, but also to use this as a marketing vehicle, but they got to get it together. Yeah, right. It's, I mean, the, 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 the issues I think. But, you know, one of them in particular is the car is just way too heavy, like way too heavy. And it's kind of like, well, how the hell? Like you already know that with this regulation, you're going to have a heavy car. Mm -hmm. And so you need to take steps to um, honor that. Like you need to understand that like, hey, we can't build certain things a certain way because of weight restrictions. We're going to be overweight. And the more you put weight on the car, you, the slower you go. And so I think once they kind of, get a handle on that. I don't know how they're going to get weight off of it. To be perfectly honest, they have to put it on a diet or something, but like, <laughs> I honestly don't know. And so yeah. it, it is, they are facing a, an uphill challenge this season. Big time, man. Like big time. Now, uh, moving off of F1 for a second and onto the FIA. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to take uh, either Susie or total wolf talk about them and not talk about formula one. Uh, but Susie Wolf has, um, uh, you know, issued this statement on her um, Instagram yesterday after reports came out. She said, I can confirm that I personally filed a criminal complaint in French courts 
on the 4th of March in relation to the statements made about me by the FIA last December. There's still not been any transparency or accountability in relation to the conduct of the FIA and its personnel in this matter. I feel more than ever it is important to stand up, call out in, improper behavior, and make sure people are held to account. While some uh, may think silence absolves them from responsibility, it does not. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're, if you're needing to kind of catch up on this, the background essentially is that there was a complaint filed and a statement made by the FIA about the relationship between Susie and Toto Wolf and potential information sharing that would be inappropriate because there's things that Susie, who heads up um, uh, the Formula Women's program. Um, F1 you know, Academy. Yeah, F1 Academy. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, you know, which has entries from all the major teams and mm -hmm. is a very exciting circuit, actually. It's been it a really is. good start. Um, yeah, it has been. Uh, like a really kind of really fun. And by the way, long overdue. Yeah. Um, like long overdue. Yeah. Um, so she's the she's the head of this. She's the most important person in the organization. They hadn't even raced yet, and she's there's an accusation that her and Toto are sharing information that's improper. We were never told because it's the FIA and they're never gonna tell us uh what that information might be, but you can speculate on it. Tim, this seems to be Susie Wolf going, not only not only was I exonerated, but I need in the future to not have this accusation leveled at me or anybody like me um and it's almost like a it's we're drawing a line in the sand that's what it feels like from the outside you know how can you what do you see when you see something like this what does this mean to you and and not knowing much about how the FIA works myself personally how does the FIA work it's essentially they're the governing body of of formula one mm -hmm. and they kind of have to police certain things Mm -hmm. And I think in, you know, in this particular case, it was a conflict. It was a, if I remember correctly, it was like a conflict of interest inquiry that was done with uh, her and husband, Toto Wolf. And uh, information sharing, I wasn't sure if it was between teams or team principals. But essentially, at the end of all of this, you had all nine teams, 10, including Mercedes, come out and issue statements that basically them saying they've never once heard of any of this. And they're, we were, they were all very confused. Like everyone else was really confused with it when we got it. I believe mm -hmm. it was in, in December when uh, we had received the messages from the FIA. She is within her rights to do this. And like, I think at the end of the day, it's kind of like, look, is, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. And let's, and let's draw, let, let's, let's take this to court yeah. and we'll get some answers and you're going to answer for what you did. And that's just the way it's going to be and, and fair game. You know, if like the, if the governing body isn't, I guess, willing to really come out and like acknowledge a mistake or acknowledge something that's been done wrong, then I mean, yeah, for sure. Like you have to make them answer for for certain things for sure i would i i would think that goes hand in hand with any sort of business or sport etc cetera, etc cetera. you know i know that it's it's for the courts always to um i mean this is a fi essentially it's a corporate investigation so it's a little bit different but you know one of the reasons we have innocent until proven guilty is because once an accusation is leveled no matter what the evidence is before people have seen the evidence they look on the accused with suspicion right so whether or not the um, whether or not they had any information at all to make those statements, and this is the problem is we don't know, and it seems like neither does Susie. Um, the fact of the matter is, when you make that allegation, the allegation sticks to the person it was made against, and for mm -hmm. the FIA to put put that out there on social media and and to make a public statement about it, um, and then not to offer um, any sort of thing other than oh it's been cleared and it, there's nothing there it 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 does kind of yeah you know, i can understand from her perspective why it's like you know what we're gonna go to court and you're gonna you're gonna come out with what you had because i think yeah i think it it no matter no matter what the outcome was it was always going to affect her reputation for sure and in a sport where reputation is so important yes. specifically it's such a like i hate to put it this way but it's an advertising driven sport 
right? You need those sponsors. You need legitimacy. We're just launching the F1 Academy after the women's series last year uh, went into uh, receivership. You know, it's it's a it's extremely important that she have a sparkling reputation and that nobody take that down. And I feel like I feel like this is her going, hey, just so you know, I do have a sparkling reputation. I am not doing anything wrong. And 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 let's not let's not go down this road again. Yeah, a lot of the legal case really does. I mean, her legal case really does revolve around that inquiry that we spoke about uh, a few minutes ago that was that was launched by the FIA into uh i think it was like a there was a magazine their claim was that uh, i think it was you know competitors had, be, uh, had competitors thought that her relationship with with toto was a conflict of interest within inside the the sport and so and every f1 team came out and said we didn't make that claim exactly like it was pretty it was it was a pretty crazy story too you know it's so yeah. funny it's so many crazy stories ago now, you know, when you oh, think about all the yeah. craziness that's happened since you almost forget, but it was a yeah. wild story. Yeah. And, and then it comes down to like, I guess, uh, you know, something we talked about quite a bit is transparency, right? Like we need more information on things and mm -hmm. especially lately, like with the stuff that was happening down at Red Bull, Christian Horner, mm -hmm. everything that's going on there. Like the transparency is, just so crucial with all of this stuff. And I think even in the, when you look at like the media side, the journalist side, like haven't really been getting that. No, no, so no, it's, it's very, very true, Tim. Um, uh, back to the, to the race for a second. Um, I want to talk about Nico Hulkenberg and a comment he made about Oliver Bierman. Um, now obviously Ollie had a great race, uh, in Jetta and everybody was really excited. But Nico Hulkenberg made a comment, and I think people took it the wrong way. I, I think he's bang on the money when he made the comment, but it sounds harsh. And what he said was, listen, if, if this guy doesn't have a good season in F2, then whatever he did in Jetta is going to be forgotten. And it sounds harsh, but it does speak to how harsh racing is, does it not? Yeah. 100%. Do you yeah, disagree? No, that, no, no, you're, I, I think like... It's that old saying, Adam, you know, the, uh, you know, you're only as good as your, your last race that still rings true today. It still rang true when I was racing, you know, years ago and years before that with other drivers. I mean, you, um, if you have a bad race, you need to have the next one needs to be a good race mm -hmm. or else things like I had mentioned at the start of the pod start to downward spiral for you in more ways than one. And Hulkenberg does have a point here I, I think it is important and I, i'd said it on sports center uh after the saudi arabian grand prix essentially like like look like he missed he missed that pole position on during that f2 race it's going to cost him points can he now win the championship and basically is essentially what i had said is it's important that he is, is in contention for it mm -hmm. or he wins it but missing out at the saudi arabian grand prix is not going to help him. And mm -hmm. so I think for him, it's, he has to have a strong weekend this weekend. Um, and whether F2, that's with Ferrari or with, I think it's Prema, yeah, right? Uh, either one it has yeah. to be a good weekend for him. He has to keep this positive momentum going mm -hmm. because I think, you know, your career really does hang in the balance with every single race weekend you, you do. And if you want to be taken seriously in formula one, I mean, if you're going to finish first, second, third in that F2 championship, you will be taken seriously. Right, right. And, I mean, I noticed that Kimi Antonelli had a much better weekend for Prema when, uh, uh, you know, in, in his second race. But that's a heck of a driver lineup, by the way. Bierman and yeah. Antonelli? Yeah, yeah, it's strong. Eh? I mean, like, I think, like, it, with, with Antonelli, it's – he needs more experience, needs more seasoning, learning from a, a driver like Ollie Bierman is – is going to be good for him. Um, I mean, I'm not expecting huge things from Kimi Antonelli this season, but mm -hmm. next season is a different story. I mean, I think people forget like how difficult Formula Two is. 
and trying to win the Formula Two championship and just be competitive in, in Formula Two. I mean, there are, I, I'm going to sit here and say there's probably 16, 17 drivers on that grid who are like legit great talent. And it's mm-hmm. like, you got to fight through that, man, to try and like, yeah. you know, show up and and put on a and put on a great performance. And so, yeah, for, for Kimmy, I think it's, again, I just think it's going to take, time and and for for ollie uh whether he races in f1 or f2 this week and by the way can you imagine you're 18 years old and you're not finished high school and you're you may race in f1 this weekend but maybe f2 <laughs> like what, what a world like think about that right that, that's a lot there's some you're pressure like juggling and you, as you're going around just yeah. like hey what's gonna happen this weekend and if you're racing in f1 you're gonna miss free practice one and two while the other driver sorts out their health yeah, man, you can't make it up. Like it'd be impossible. Like I, I don't know, Adam. Like, is there any equivalent to like let's use the NHL as an example? Like, is there? I well, mean, the like, NHL, you got to be out of high school. You can right. make it at eighteen, but you got to be out of high school. You cannot be like you cannot cannot join until you're done high school. Cannot happen. But it, so if you're in the OHL, you're basically you're probably in high school. I'm assuming you are in high school. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the guys, like if you're, let's say you're from Toronto and you get drafted by uh, the Sudbury Wolves or Sault Ste. Marie, you get put up in a billet family, right? Yep. And you get, I think you get some sort of a little bit of a stipend to pay for meals and things like that. But yep. you're literally moving to a new city, living with a family you've never met before, yep. and trying to play hockey and go to school. It's a lot of it's pressure. Um, but it's not, it's not quite, and, 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 you know, a comparable with ice hockey and formula one, as much as ice hockey is a bigger, um, is a bigger money revenue thing because they've got a bigger overall business in North America. Like, you know, uh, revenue for the NHL is like 6.2 billion. I think for formula one, it's three and a half billion, but it's, that's, that's just formula one, the body that doesn't mean the teams formula one's a bigger sport. It's got a international eye, um, and frankly, when you're when you're in a, a team Ferrari like driver um, like Bierman is, you're also dealing with the history of Ferrari, right? It's Ferrari. There's you know as what did Bonotto say in, in Drive to Survive is like you ask a kid to drive to to draw a car and they'll draw a Ferrari. Yeah, just right. Just, yeah, yeah, he's not. Not wrong, right? Not it's wrong. Not like, and it's not like Adam. It's like the AHL like equivalent, like F two, right? It's it's not like that. It's like F two would would kind of be that OHL, yeah, sort of point where you then make it to the big leagues. That's right. That that is what F two would be. And if you were, I mean, like allowed to to do it, like you would simply pluck the top talent out of the OHL to fill in for you know, uh, Evgeny Malkin, yeah. you know, for, you a ra- for, for, for a game and then send them back down. Yeah. You can't, you can't do that. Like it, that's what essentially Ferrari is asking of here. Oh, like, it's, it's crazy. It's a crazy <laughs> ask. And, um, but I mean, that is the sport. It is, it is like, if, if, if you're going to get in, you better perform. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of preparation you have. You have to be as ready matter. as you can. You have so. to be ready. Yeah. Now 100%. speaking, one of the places that, that if Bierman has a good year, uh, he's been speculated already to go to his Haas. You know, Haas is obviously very closely linked to Ferrari. They drive a Ferrari engine. And um, in the past, we're supposed to sort of act like, and no one wants to say it out loud, but they're supposed to sort of act like they they can season some of the younger Ferrari drivers before they join Ferrari. It hasn't quite worked out that way. Mick Schumacher was one of the guys that, you know, people were like, well, maybe. Um, but with uh, a guy like Bierman joining a team like Haas, I, I, I think it's been interesting because the Hulkenberg comments one thing, and I think he's right. The second thing I want to talk about is Ayo Komatsu and the changes he's already brought to this team. They're faster than what we thought they would be. They have to be scrappy because Gene Haas is not going to spend big money. Um, although they are spending cap to close to the cap, I think. Um, Tim, the one thing I wanted to talk about is there was some accusations leveled and n- nobody would come out and put their name on it as far as I could see that Haas were unsportsmanlike when Magnuson... Oh, I think it was actually Alex yeah. Alba. Unsportsmanlike. No, no, it, it would have been with it would have been with Magnuson at the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. 
Yeah, and Magnuson, who basically took yeah. a bunch of darts the whole game, had all those penalties, everything, <laughs> to did. make sure that Nico Hulkenberg got into the points. He really <laughs> held up the rest of the field. Alex Albon, in particular, played great defense on, on him. And Yuki Sonoda, too. He played good defense on him, too. And yeah. Yuki's a good passer. So, yeah. He's oh, really yeah, quick. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's good. So, so... I mean, obviously, they probably weren't thrilled with Magnuson's penalties, but that's all negated by the fact that the team got points, and Magnuson made sure that they did. Uh, so great teamwork between Nico Hulkenberg and, and Magnuson, but people called that unsportsmanlike. What do you think? Total BS, man. Like, they played yeah. the game, and they got the point. That's just the way it is. Look, if you know, you're given the penalty, you can serve it any way you want mm -hmm. unless the FIA dictates how they want you to serve it. If it's a drive through penalty, there's nothing you can do about it. It is a drive through penalty and you're doing that. If you're going to yep. do to get 10 second penalty, you can serve it in a pit stop. You can serve it after the race. Guys fighting for points, teams fighting for points. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. I, I really don't. Um, it's Magnuson, creative did a great job, you know, playing defense and that's not easy to do. I uh, really sacrificed a lot of his race mm -hmm. uh, to do that. And that's, he's playing the team game, right? Like he really, he knew he, he knew he'd screwed up and gotten those penalties and gotten the penalties, but he knew he also had to play a team game as well. And so, yeah, that's how I feel about it. I don't know. How do you see it? Well, I look at Kevin Magnuson's career status. If, if, um, you know, he's one of the guys, one of the 15 or 17 or whoever's out of contract next year. And, you know, Beerman's having this great race. And Nico Hulkenberg has been really good in qualifying, which sets Haas up for a better result because, you know, the opportunities for them to be fast over a sustained period of time, they've started fast like they did a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. But, you know, their upgrades have tended not to work in the last couple of years. So this yeah. might be the chance to harvest as many points as you can. Yeah. I look at it and I go, okay, so there are going to be teams next year on the grid that are rebuilding. And maybe you want a veteran driver who will play ball, who play team. You know, this is a guy who I think, you know, I don't think Magnuson's career has gone the way that he would have hoped when he came in with McLaren. Like he was really a, a highly touted rookie. And I think people wanted... I think he would have expected to be more successful than he has been. But at this stage in his career, he can't look at it like world titles. He's got to look at it like, how do I maintain this seat and play ball and stay here? And I think that that's the, what a, what a great ringing endorsement. Like, yeah. here's the thing, Tim, like Nico Hulkenberg to me is the better driver of that team, at least right now, based on performance. Yeah. But if he gets poached and they bring in Beerman, Magnuson seems like a really good guy to, to, to work with him. Um, yeah. and if, and if Hulkenberg stays and then Beerman goes and they move on from Magnuson, there's, there's drives open. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, if you're a, uh, uh, a now, I, I mean, you can't even, can you can't even call them Sauber anymore? Audi owned, um, stake team, or is that, you know, is, is Williams looking for somebody because Albon moved on or Logan Sargent moved on? you like, you, there's so many opportunities there. Yeah. And, and I think he's maximizing his potential for a job, not not just at Haas, but next year with somebody else. Yeah, right. Percent. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think I, you know, I definitely agree with you on on all that. And uh, moving, uh, I mean, he does he does give himself a lot of or some opportunity to to move by playing the team game, and then the performance side of things that will need to be elevated for for Kevin. Um, he, I. I it's hard for me to see him at another team in the future. Yeah. Only because of where the performance has been lately. Uh, and we're going back to last season as well. Uh, yeah. Where Hulkenberg I, just outperformed him. Yeah, that too. And trying to just get, trying to get the grips with uh, the race car and figure out what he needs to extract the performance from it. And like, I think like he's a great racing driver. Don't get me wrong here. So it's kind of like, the more he can show that he has a lot of value left in him, playing the team game is important, scoring a point is important, and beating your teammate is important. If he can start checking two of those other things off that off that list, you know he may find himself being able to convince 
a team that's further down the grid to to keep him around in Formula One? I think for me, Tim, the the thing with Kevin Magnuson, and this goes in for Daniel Ricardo too, the the unforced errors, the brain farts mm. per race, it's got to come down, right? There are mistakes that sometimes, and these nobody's denying the talent of either of them. They're the top twenty drivers in the world, mm-hmm. right? But if you make mistakes like Magnuson made, if you make mistakes like Ricardo may, made, and and I I know that you you said like they were trying to figure out some issues with the Ricardo car, I get it, totally understand. If those guys can bring those mistakes down, just that will gain them two or three more positions every race. All right. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I'm sure Haas loved Nico Hulkenberg getting points, but what if they could have had both drivers challenging for points? They oh, would have liked man. that a lot more. That would have been huge for them. It's such a, it's such a, a log jam trying to get that final point mm-hmm. right right now. I mean, you've got five teams, all of those drivers capable of scoring points. And so if you're going to be that one team, it's just sniffing at that 10th spot mm-hmm. in case a mistake happens from the other 10 drivers, then, you know, you want to be in position to capitalize on that and, that you know, that's pretty much what Haas did on on uh, uh, last two Saturdays ago. <laughs> I'm I'm looking at it too. If I'm Ayo Komatsu, you know, race strategist extraordinaire before and now team principal, Williams to me, their big weakness is, and it's not because he's a bad driver. He's Logan Sargent. It's because he's a newer driver, and it's because he's figuring it out. I'm not saying that his pace is bad. His results haven't been there like in the way that they, that Williams needs, especially with the performance of that car. Um, Haas could beat Williams this year, just based on the fact that they were stingier with the points. Cause mm-hmm. a lot of the, the, the strategy, a lot of the upgrades, a lot of everything through in Williams goes through Alex Albon. So if, if, you know, even if Albon scores double the points of the other two drivers, Haas could still beat them in the drivers. And that's worth tens of millions of dollars. Yeah, really constructors. Important. Yeah, constructors for sure. Like, I mean, I think for for Williams, it's trying to understand this new aero direction they've gone in, this new mm-hmm. platform that they developed for for this year, because it is such a big turn from what they've been working with for the past two seasons. And so, mm-hmm. to make a drastic change like that takes time to figure out what what it needs. What does the driver need to do with it to get that performance out of it? Mm-hmm. I think, you know, I think the car may be a little bit overweight. Again, another one of those cars that is just a little bit overweight. And I think, you know, that costs you time for sure. And so trying to sort that out is important. For Logan, it's it's learning, right? It's mm-hmm. this is a brand new car. This is a brand new concept. You got to do different things with this thing than you did with that thing. And for Alex, he's got that experience of having Adjusting. to, yeah, having to adjust every single season. Yeah. Well, Tim, it's going to be an exciting race in Australia. Really looking forward to it. And listen, when we when we reconnect, there's going to be bags under our eyes, but that's going to be okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Look, looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, me too, buddy. So, um, so obviously be uh, be on the lookout. Follow Tim Haraney at Tim Haraney. I love saying his name because it is a great, strong name, Tim Haraney. <laughs> It just feels like it's like, and now your host, Tim Rainey. It feels strong. Um, Thanks, Adam. I appreciate it. So, Tim, I hope you have a great race weekend. I know we're going to be texting back and forth the entire oh, yeah. time. Um, Thanks, buddy. But, but it's going to be it's going to be really exciting. Let's have a good one. We'll do a show this weekend to recap it all. Cool. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. <laughs>